uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Senerkan, for uh, first of all, for uh, inviting me to your uh, seminar and, and, and second of all, for uh, the nice introduction. Um, so, right, so I'm going to talk about uh, OpenEO. Uh, Serkan said I'm affiliated with the Institute for Geoinformatics here in Münster, which is like an hour from uh, Enschede um, by train or by car, a little bit longer by, by bike. Um, and uh, I worked there since 2007. I'm also one of the initiators of OpenEO, which we talk about and, and associated with the R Foundation. This is joint work with a long list of uh, authors, uh, Alexander Jakob and Dias Moore, Patrick Griffiths from ESA, uh, Christian Briese from UDC, Jeroen Dries from Vito, Grega Milsinski from Synergize, Michiel Klaus, and then other, a lot of other people from the, basically from the same uh, organizations. Alexander is from, uh, from URAC. Um, and um, and and basically the the open your team that and I will uh, at some stage I will switch over to a number of slides that are that 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 uh, that uh, reflect recent activity more. Uh, but first of all, I will uh, say a little bit of sort of where I come from, so that you maybe better understand where what I what I'm doing, where, why I'm doing the things that I'm I'm doing, or it's some, at least something that sometimes I try to understand myself. So I studied in uh, in Utrecht University, which is also very close to. Uh, to Enschede, just the uh, other direction. Uh, studied there from 85 to 91, and then did my PhD studies from 91 with, from, to 96, um, supervised by Peter Burrow. And Peter Burrow, as you see on the right-hand side, is the author of the first textbook on GIS. Yeah, this is a textbook that arrived in 1986, Principles of Geographical Information Systems. There's a second edition that is much more extensive and more well-known. This is the cover of the first edition that we were uh, supposed to uh, to buy for our uh, GIS courses that we took with with Peter when I was a sort of an undergraduate. Um, in those times, there was a lot of activity going on. The group in, of Peter, uh, where I was uh, later on research, we did a, we developed a lot of stuff, and uh, he was also developing stuff. He would write programs in basics that that generated volcanoes and developed landscapes and these kind of things, and sort of a, a, a professor and a crazy nerd at the same time. That was very inspiring. Uh, we used in that the time a lot of C to program things, to make programs portable, because there was already the problem of having um, Apple Macs around and, and, and MS-DOS machines, later Windows machines and Unix machines and so on. And basically what we, what we worked on a lot is understanding file formats, so establishing file formats for raster data, for instance. That was one of the things that we did in Utrecht. That meant interoperability. In those days, we didn't use that word yet. Um, in the 80s, so when I started studying, the landscape of GIS basically looked like this. We had, you had a GIS, which has a, was a big software on a big machine that had a database in the back end. And you used one of these things and with absolutely no possibility of, of sort of, you know, going from one system to the other or something like that, or trying different things out on different machines. That was sort of not, uh, not done. This is one of the figures that, that comes from, an, from a blog post. The link is here on the right hand side. Um, I can, by the way, I can, um, oh no, I did not do this. Um, and um, so this, this was sort of uh, JS in the 80s. Um, then what came later on was sort of the, the idea of file formats, right? That it was very convenient that, that you would write sort of files, the spatial data in, in, in file formats that were understood by, by several software so that you could write things and read them in the, in the next environment, right? There was some exchange of things. Not sure if yeah, JPEG 2000 already existed in those days, but this is just the, to get the idea, right? This, this happened in the 90s, the sort of big file form thing. But of course, you see that this is a, a hopeless hodgepodge of sort of an end-to-end -end problem, like every system has to re, has to understand all these file formats. So what happened in, in sort of late, already in the 90s, was picked up in the 2000s, was basically that, um, that it was software that could read all these files, right? And right now that software, is, that software was and still is the GDAL or Goodall uh, library, which is a library for a geospatial data um, access library. You know, data, geospatial data. I'm trying to think what the abbreviation stands for. But in any case, this is still the case that all these environments that you look at, this is not an exhaustive list. Of course, PostGIS is missing, for instance. But everything that's open source reads data and is not Java then it will sort of use this GDAL library to uh, to read things. Even ArcGIS does it, right? And then there's all these formats that can be read. So if you have a new format 
and you write a GDAL driver for it, you're then basically directly assured that quantum GIS grass and cetera, everyone can read this data, right? So you don't have to modify all that software on the top. You just have to add a, a driver, sort of a driver, a plugin, so to speak, to the GDAL library. And this is similar uh, for the project library for project pro, uh, for cartographic projections and datum transformation nowadays and geo uh, library for uh, geometric operations like like polygon intersections and these kinds of things. So this is basically what what happened, you know, last 10, 20 years. Um, here is a view of a similar idea, basically, of how things work in the R spatial uh, uh, community. There is uh, essentially currently a package SF that deals with vector data, right? So points, lines, polygons, uh, and that it does that not by sort of you know by coming of ideas by itself, but basically by interfacing these libraries, in particular GDAL proj and, and geos, um, and making all the functions that are available in these library easily available to our users so that they don't have to think about much about installing software and so on, right? This is one of the advantages of R that package installation is, is sort of uh, effortless and, and, and simply works, right? And then you get all these packages that reuse that those ideas and can deal with these objects and so on and and basically can do a lot of uh, fun things and and sort of all, by aligning things with the regular way uh, that tabular information is handled in R basically by extending data frames uh, this is sort of becomes extremely uh, flexible and you see that that basically the SF is kind of the the, the interoperability layer there because it, it it draws in all these libraries that are that are basically used by a much larger community into the R ecosystem and, and users can then sort of effortlessly uh, use that. And that is of, of, also, of course, also an, an enormous sort of uh, um, uh, level of interoperability that you get there. But if you would use, if you would ask an, 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 an arbitrary R user, like, could you explain me what interoperability is? Then the person will say, I have no clue, right? Because, but it's basically what they do, right? They use R because, they, there's a shared understanding of what a vector, what a data frame, or what a what a character vector, and so on, or what a factor is, and what a list is, and these kind of things. So you reuse these structures, and then everyone, everything understands that, and and so it makes things easy and and sort of uh, comprehensible. And that's of course the same thing for Python, uh, where you also once you're on the Python prompt and understand how things work, it's very easy to do that. Um, and then, of course, there is the packaging thing that if you want to draw in GDAL and GEOS and everything in, in Python, that uh, that is sort of an, another uh, another issue that I'm not going to talk about. Um, right. This is a figure that is taken from the book. This is sort of the spatial data science book that we're writing. I'm writing with Roger Biffen together. So um, that is for, with R. So in R, everything is fine, right? But R is, of course, sort of a you know a relatively confined environment. So now is the problem that we have satellite imagery and Earth observation data, and that these data are you know are nowadays open and freely available, but are too large to download, right? So you can do toy day, toy problems, download your data, read it through GDAL, through Netsy, whatever, through uh, packages. The packages uh, Raster and Terra are not mentioned here, but of course they are also part of the playing important part of the whole uh, of the whole story. Um, so you can download it and do things locally, but then you want to sort of do something over Western Europe, over Sentinel-2 data over the last, uh, last five years or something like that. And then you go, how am I going to download this, right? Or who is going to download this for me to where, right? And then you get into these practical problems that big downloads are very impractical and not really doable. So what you need is kind of an, a place where these data are and where you can analyze them and then a way to analyze them, right? And there's now an enormous amount of ways of doing this. Um, and here's just a list of them. This is already a somewhat older list. Uh, there are many new, you know, there is nowadays this Microsoft planetary, whatever planetary something uh, going on. And and, um, and sort of, you know, these, these things come up like, like uh, you know, pop up like mushrooms, as I wrote somewhere, uh, the, the Earth, big Earth observation data uh, analysis platforms. Yeah, which is interesting. And so, so we have Google Earth Engine and we have Sentinel Hub and we have this software that Vito uses. Vito is one of the largest cloud providers in uh, Earth observation cloud providers in Europe. EODC Earth Observation Data Center has its own system using the supercomputer in Vienna, um, universities, Wageningen and so on, uh, uh, Berlin and, and whatever will do their own thing, will build their own sort of, you know, big storage things. and. And if you do that, it is, you know, things might work internally, but um, 
pretty soon it, it is sort of becomes an enormous mess because it, you know, it, it is hard to scale things. Um, and, and so what you, what you get is sort of in-house solutions that work for people that are in-house because you can explain them, but people are never going to share how they do it because they're so embarrassed of, of sort of how things were, were, were put together. Right. And, and that is, you know, that is of course not so good. So the question is like, uh, okay, I'm an earth engine user and I do something with earth engine, something strange comes out. Right. But who will verify that this was the right thing that came out, right? How can I verify that? There are two problems. The one problem is that I don't have access to the source code of the Earth engine. You know, it, it looks like in JavaScript, but everything that happens is, is within their system. The other, the other thing is that my whole sort of request to Earth engine, I cannot put anywhere else. I cannot send it to, to this data center or to this data center because it is an entirely different structure. So. First of all, nobody else, nobody working with another system understands what I do. And second of all, I cannot, you know, the effort it takes to really compare things is way too large in, in terms of the benefits that I would get in finding a bug or something like that. So this is really bad for science, right? So we, we end up with using a system and end up with all kinds of questions, but nobody can help us because there's no way of comparing one thing to the other. If we talk about Sentinel-2, are we talking about exactly the same data or not? This kind of question. So we wanted to sort of work on that problem, and that is what we did, uh, basically by uh, by thinking about and then and later on developing, writing, and implementing an, an API that is called OpenEO that basically is an interface to uh, all to arbitrary backends. So that basically generalizes uh, all all the operations that you can do on these backends. Um, and that then basically can be accessed through uh, different and through different environments. Yeah, so we developed the API, we developed uh, plugins or, or packages or libraries for whatever you want to call it, or, or, or uh, JavaScript things that work in browsers and can, can work interactively. And we basically write your problem in a single way and then can decide where will I send it, right? And then what you need to, of course, need to develop is, is backends. That means translators that, that translate what is what is happening here in this dialect to the thing that is happening here in this dialect and in this dialect and so on. So you need to still implement these things. The thing is that all these all these operate all these backends and there is also you know many of them ODC is essentially an, an, an XRA environment on top of a, um, using a, whatever a post GIS data Postgres database for the for the catalog or something like that. Um, so all these environments essentially do the same, right? So they, they have image collections and they want to do some kind of data cube operations, right? Sort of aggregate temporarily and, and sort of do some time series modeling, do some, some machine learning and so on. But there's, there's the, 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 operate, the, the sort of the functionality of all these platforms is very much, um, has, a, has, a very strong, uh, has a very strong overlap. So what you, would good, what you would get with an ecosystem this way is that once you make your your particular backend uh, compatible with uh, with this API that you get for free essentially all these interfaces right that you basically in, at one step uh, make it possible for our users to use and for Python users or for people who wanted to do interactive modeling uh, in a graphical environment or want to use quantum GIS right so this is and an, this is sort of an, from in terms of architecture would be a, you know a compatibility. Um, a thing that would be similar to essentially this problem, right? This is the, the name of the blog is a GDAL for Earth observation, a big Earth observation data platform. So the question then, of course, that arises is um, is like, um, is this not, you know, is this not this? Are we not here? Like, you know, I hope that some of you have seen this before. Uh, we have 40 competing standards. Oh, this is ridiculous. Let's, let's develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. And then in the end, we have 15 competing standards, right? So the question is, aren't we there? Yeah, there is always the risk yeah, that you do something that nobody that nobody's waiting for. Um, on the other hand, if you think of this problem, this particular problem, like, you know, what are the other 14 sort of standards that do actually this, right? The problem is that we have 14 of these that are incompatible. So in any, any way, so to, um, you know, you cannot write one that replaces this. And this is also not meant to replace anything. It's sort of meant to, to get, you know, to, to figure out the confusion between all these platforms and to sort of see if we can sort of translate all these things to a sort of a common set of, a common set of operations defined here. Um, so that is the idea. 
Um, the funding situation of OpenEO is basically that we started with this. Uh, so we started we started with this with this uh, uh, group of of people and then uh, wrote and um, and a call wrote a project proposal for the Horizon 2020 call EO Big Data Shift in 2016 that got granted in 2017, got some about two million funding and that was an sort of an extremely um, interesting and and, and fruitful project in the sense that I've been in uh, I've been in many uh, EU projects and I've never been in a project where actually so much was so much was uh, uh, succeeded so much happened yeah so of course there's a lot of you know a lot of noise always going on in EU projects but he was sort of a really a core group that believed in the idea and that managed to set up an infrastructure to uh, to carry this out and and to basically implement like four or five different uh, backends and have a number of use cases run uh, on them. Yeah, and there was the, one of the reasons that this worked is that a number of organizations were involved that actually do this and that were actually looking for um, they were actually looking for a solution to the problem of of having having an, a, a very clumsy uh, uh, processing backend, right? And and having to you know, uh, getting new users and what am I going, how am I going to teach them to use our system? Yeah, so there was really a demand for uh, for an improved system. And one of them was was Vito, which is a company where about 100 people work also, right? So they do a lot of uh, real production and day, day-to-day uh, production and others were URAC and EODC. They have basically this also as a, as a business and they used this, they developed this and used it directly on the sort of on in, in a production environment to uh, to uh, to try this out. So although this was a proof of concept, it basically led to an, to the development of an API. An API is basically an, a, a formalism that this is essentially the open API uh, a formalism that all APIs now use nowadays use, but also to the definition of a set of processes. Yeah. So I can uh, I can sorry this is not where I wanted to go. Um, I think this is processes that open um, Yeah. One. One thing is api.openio.org, which describes the, API, the, the whole API. This is, this is sort of a standard thing that you see uh, from the, uh, created from, from, from Swagger APIs and so on. And you can see the whole sort of the whole uh, documentation, everything is there. Uh, but the main sort of the main thing is really the, the processes that we implemented. And those, there are a lot. And this essentially what we did is, is not just say, well, we want to do, we have a process that is called uh, ARD, and we will have a process that does, does, does you know, uh, whatever, remove clouds or something like that. But that we sort of really went into how programming languages work and and develop and, and implemented all the all the math operators that all uh, programming languages have, so that you can, in the end, write arbitrary expressions, uh, arbitrary complex expressions, and nested expressions, and so on, that are then sort of uh, um, represented in a in a what we call a process graph, which is ex- essentially an expression tree. Like R and Python do that too. C compilers do that too. They, there's there's expressions with arbitrary uh, complexity, and they are basically being understood and and, and compiled and executed. Yeah? So this is also what we what we do here. So there's a lot of sort of lower level stuff, but also a lot of higher level stuff that work sort of operators that work on uh, data cubes, so that you can do particular operations. Compute the mean over layers of, of spatial layers, or the mean over time series, and all these kind of things that you basically reduce dimensions because this is what you constantly do, or ap- apply functions over a particular dimension, or apply function over time series. And we also left the sort of the possibility here is the UDF uh, to have user-defined functions um, that are basically arbitrary chunks of Python or R that are being pull- pushed to the back end and that's basically evaluated there. That means that you have of an ultimate flexibility. But if you want your, your own uh, time series analysis program to program it out in Python or R, then you can do that and you can execute it there and have it basically executed on your on your pixels without the need to, to download any data. So that is something that really is interesting for scientists that want to have the ultimate flexibility. Um, and those are things that you cannot easily do with, or that you cannot do at all with uh, Earth Engine, for instance, yeah, for good reasons. Or for not for good reasons, but for an understandable reasons. Um, right. So, um, so this is this is the the API and the processes. Um, just 
me just try to go back to this one. Um, so that was uh, what happened in the in the uh, Horizon 2020 project. Then we uh, we missed uh, the opportunity to get follow up funding from Horizon 2020. This is clearly you know uh, convenient funding in the sense that it's it's uh, once you get it. Uh, what we did get is uh, with with essentially or pretty much the same consortium uh, is um, is the ITT called Open Earth Engine, where ESA called for sort of an earth engine type uh, environment that needed to be completely open and open source and everything and needed to be able to do everything uh, for an, a surprisingly small amount. Uh, and so we were a little bit in doubt, like, you know, with, with the 137 require, technical requirements they had, is this realistic to, to you know, to, to write a bit? But then uh, on the other hand, we had already spent 2 million in, in developing basically things that were essentially asked for in this, uh, in this ITT, yeah? so we thought also, well, if it's not us, who is then going to do it? Because clearly, in this period of time, nobody else was working on solving this particular problem. It also needed to be federated and so on, and do, do all kind of um, pretty much more uh, sort of use cases that also had to scale, where we showed to it, we had to show that it scales and it is performant and it is fast and so on, and do modern ARD uh, analysis ready data and, and, and its pre processing things. Uh, so it did work and that started um, and this now has been uh, basically launched at the ESA five week like a couple of weeks ago i hope some of you were were also there and if you were there you certainly haven't missed it because it was pretty uh, clear with a keynote from alexander Jakob and so on uh, and announced by by ESA and and so on so um so that's basically what i'm going to uh, talk now about is, is the opening platform which is uh, which means that that is an uh, that is not just you know an API and processes, but that is basically an implementation and an offering of a running platform uh, that does things for for you for users, right? And it says here, yeah, there is call for early adopters, and the early adoption thing is is for free. And of course, the you know this is one of the one of the difficult things here that uh, cloud computing is not free, right? There is no such thing as free cloud computing. So you get you know you uh, you get uh, free accounts with Earth Engine and with Microsoft planetary stuff and, and things, uh, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't cost them anything, right? So it's not that is that these things are, or that you have unlimited uh, processing capacity or something like that. Right? So there are limits to things, and there is, in, in particular cases, another organization who takes over the costs of you. Yeah? There is no such thing as a as a free, and this makes it this this gets much harder if you then want to do something similar and. And then you know have to look for resources like who is going to pay for all these free early adopter uh, usage and um, and that is that is basically the, the the whole European problem I would say right so we have no problem in in spending whatever fifty billion for creating satellites but we have really serious problems in in you know getting a couple of million together to get to get you know a free computing platform for people uh, uh, going right so this was a uh, in my eyes, the sort of the biggest mistake of the whole Copernicus problem, the whole providing the data for free was an afterthought in Copernicus, right? Originally, the data were not planned to be free. And then they thought, oh, no, let's make them for free. And then they didn't think about, okay, what shall we do with them, right? So this is the, the you know, part of the mess, it comes from that. And, and the other part of the mess comes from Europe never, you know, being Europe and ESA also speaking with so many tongues and wanting many things and, and all these kind of things. So it's it's, it's politics is really sort of a, a major uh, a major obstacle there. Um, open your platform. These are the slides that Alexander Jakob, of course, made with you know with help from from ESA. ESA is is has these uh, is very helpful if you want to have strong graphics. So so these are the graphics that the that they create, which is really, which is really lovely. Like you know, a scientist like me would never, you know, would, we can only dream of these kind of things. And also, this this logo of the Open Your Platform here at the bottom right is has sort of has is white, right? So it doesn't even work on my slides. I couldn't even copy and paste it. Yeah, so it's you know, one of one of these little things. But anyway, this was the sort of slides from the keynote that Alexander Jakob gave at the ESA Five Week uh, about three four weeks ago. Um, Summarizing why we need this, well, there are capability gaps. There are a number of things we, we, we cannot do. There's the data management burden you want to sort of uh, address. You want to get get rid of this 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 download and local local serving thing. You want to avoid vendor lock-in, and you want to 
make it possible to to establish reproducibility, right? To be able to sort of check and to verify different backends against each other. Um, there is the API, there's processes, and there's the clients, which I already mentioned all of them. Um, and the, the question is what what additional value brings an open an open your platform? Um, there is open you know, as a service that we can that we basically can do. Uh, the data and processing federation uh, idea that we have data that come from different that that are available from different uh, cloud centers, so to speak, that you want to bring together, and how you're going to do that. Uh, this is one of the use cases, and there's added capabilities and use cases that we that we are basically committed to uh, working that we already have done and have been presented, or that we are going to do uh, in the next twelve months. Uh, there's the early adopters program and there's also a user forum uh, available for this for this platform so this is all about the opening platform the running system um, the um, the original uh, problem was that basically you had to go right you had to have n by n if we have sort of three different systems they do all kinds of things and in different environments they want to use them that we have to write all these interfaces that are incompatible uh, the problem is that or, you know, traditional remote sensing uh, processing uh, basically works like this. We have a, we have, we, we, we focus on a particular area. We search for tiles. Uh, we download tiles. We pre-process tiles to level 2A. We resample the target spatial resolution. We create a subset in space and time. Apply the algorithms to the subset and, and package basically the product, right? Or, or, or make it into a map and a publication or something like that as if you were a scientist. And all these steps are basically done in a relatively ad hoc way and are, are very hard to reproduce, right? Or how do you, how do you, we can wrap them up, right? How do you do this? How, how, how do you, uh, if you do all these steps, like how are you going to communicate as such that somebody else is inclined to look at what you did and, and basically redo it or, or change a little thing or something like that? This is a, a big problem in a remote sensing, uh, you know, for several reasons. Uh, is I think one of the science areas that is very bad at this. Yes, or is there is or uh, science areas that are much better at doing these kinds of things. Yeah, think of statistics. They're an enormous. You're, if you're if you're a statistician and you develop, develop a new method, then nobody believes you unless you share the source code, right? And this is already for twenty years the case. So there is a much other very other tra uh, tradition there. But then of course here it, part of the problem is uh, the size of the data sets you will or, or do not want to share. There are also some data sets that are simply not open, right? Um, so what happens quite often is that you basically go to where you get some virtual machine somewhere where the data are or, or on your own system. You need to take care of CPUs and uh, memory requirements and parallelism and all kinds of tasks that you go going or not going to to uh, distribute over different machines and different threads and so on. So you, you end up with doing, if you want to do this on scale, you end up with a nightmare of management and a nightmare of, of requirements to scientists where scientists really don't want to sort of think about, right? Why, why think about parallelism, right? Why would you, why would you do this? It's entirely un, uninteresting for, for, scientific, for scientists, right? So you need to be a computer scientist and then computer scientists don't understand the remote sensing that way, right? So that's, 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 not, that's not working. So that is why this API basically came out, which kind of kind of uh, tunnels this whole thing and abstracts things such that you do your requests on image collections or data cubes straight away, rather than rather than saying you know get this tile. So you don't see any tiles. Tiles are there, of course, uh, but they are not they're not seen, right? They are not sort of you don't you're not looping over tiles. You're just looping over. You're just doing something for an area, and and doing it possibly at a lower resolution, right? So you don't need to do a lot of things for larger areas you don't need to do for all of the 10 meter pixels because nobody's going to look at these 10 meter pixels anyway in the end. So we have this RESTful API, the Open API specification, and a set of process descriptions, and um, and all these sort of interfaces, of course, need to you know need to be there. So that we call this the backend interfaces, and these are the client interfaces. So they need to be written and, and developed. Uh, and one strong aspect is the stack, the spatial temporal asset catalog, which is a new emerging standard for describing where image collections are. And actually OpenEO Horizon 2020 um, project was, was very important for uh, getting the stack 
descriptions for image collections. Yes, yeah? Stack was very much focused on describing where the tiles are, but here you don't want to work on the tile, you want to work on collections. You want to sort of say, I want to do this for this area in that time period for Sentinel-2, where Sentinel-2 is my collection. Um, right, OGC API, well. Um, so there is the, uh, so there are basically the, the several steps that we have. So we have different clients that do things that need to select data, that need to specify what they want to analyze and that need to have access to the result where the result can, for instance, be offered through some kind of a, a service where you see things on the map or can be downloaded as some kind of GeoTIFF or NetCDF, uh, DataCube stuff. Um, and all that has to go basically to the backend infrastructure and be computed and, and result, right? So there we have the issues of job management, graph processing, execute engine, and they are all not a worry of the scientist, right? The user sort of happens here and expresses her problem in terms of data I want to use, in terms of the analysis I want to do on the data and how I want to have my results and all this kind of computer science uh, implementation related stuff is sort of, so this is a real separation of concern uh, thing, right? We have different backends. Some use this Dask framework, other use Oh, whatever, Kubernetes to distribute, other use Air, Apache Airflow to do to do this whole uh, um, to do this whole sort of thing, uh, but nobody, no, no user in this site will ever notice that, right? You shouldn't even notice which backend uses where you are and, and what kind of technology it uses because it is utterly uninteresting. Um, what we do is basically the idea is that that we analyze data by using a, a data cube which basically user defines on the fly right so we have image collections so the raw tiles are there and they are of course a mix and they don't, don't nicely stack up and so on there is this whole time stuff and so on but once we analyze them we have to say similar to we learned it basically from google earth engine you say well i'm going to use with monthly data and i'm going to use in this coordinate reference system i want to work on a 100 meter grid or something like a 100 meter raster or a thousand meter raster or, or just a 10 meter pixel or something um, you can then um, express the whole process basically uh, as, a, as a process graph, we call it like this. These can be created graphically. We will see that basically by specifying where, what is the input image collection and that then what is the process that creates a data cube that's used here. This, this does something else. And, and that basically gives you the flow of the things and, and then can tell what comes out here and how do you want to sort of see that, right? How do you want to access that? Um, um, what we what we did uh, one of the motivations of doing this was to basically uh, to be able to compare different backends and this is a result from the Horizon 2020 uh, project uh, where we did one process graph doing some kind of time series on NDVI time to maximum of a particular time period over an area and we see that these were these were sort of the answers we got from six different backends UVC URAC, uh, JRC uh, Wageningen Vito and Synergy. Yeah, so you immediately see there's a big problem there. The good thing is that there is, you know, similarities. Yeah, there's, it's not, it's not like six different answers. But the bad thing is, of course, there's two strongly differing uh, sort of sets. Yeah, in any case. Yeah, there are, and, and this seems also to be different. So there you can go and say, see, like, okay, what is going on, right? Apparently Sentinel-2 is not Sentinel-2, right? So there might be something going on with a normalization that, that took place here, but not here, or, or vice versa, right? So these are the kind of things that you then uh, find and that you can only find out by, by doing these things. So this that this came out was actually a great result. And for the first time that something like that was, was being done, I claim, in the remote sensing community. Yeah, so this is for terms of reproducibility and validation of Earth observation backends, a very big step. Uh, that will become sort of a standard step if there is more adaption of, of OpenEO or of a similar idea. I don't care, right? If somebody else wants to do this differently and solve the same problem, be my guest. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but I think that problem needs to be solved. I think there is a problem that needs to be solved. So the platform background, uh, as I said, is... Uh, uh, addresses the Open Earth Engine uh, ITT is a is a, 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 um, a joint venture of uh, of all these uh, organizations where EGI is basically um, the uh, an organization that is involved in the European Open Science Cloud and uh, allows to do uh, authentication. Right, it has an authentication system that connects all, for instance, all university authentication. So if you are if you have a university account at the University of Twente. 
then you can go to OpenEO and you can say at, at the EGI account, I'm University of Twente, and you go to your your account, local account system, log in and say, can EGI do this? Yes, can do that. And then you're there with your under your own account. Um, the goal is to uh, reuse and integrate existing components, essentially the things that we developed earlier. Um, it includes three EO cloud operators, so EODC and uh, Vito and, and URAC uses its own uh, sort of uh, private cloud and uh, builds on an active uh, user community already, which includes the, the actual companies or, or parties involved in this. So the drive and co uh, concepts for addressing uh, the capability gap is that it, it is enables simplicity, as we say. So we do we focus on analysis, on libraries, and so on, rather than on um, rather than on, on you know virtual machines and management of, of cloud resources or something like that. Uh, we provide transparency of source code. All of the backends are, are open source, uh, uh, and by that sort of try to you know foster or uh, stimulate scientific integrity and reproducibility. And, uh, and create clarity in prior estimation of costing. Yeah, this is another difficult thing um, that, that if you have a large job and you want to have it done, yeah, you want to, you'd like to pay for it and sort of how is this going to work and how is this going to be handled. Uh, and also you would like to be able to do uh, to, to have confidentially and, and, and sort of if people have their own data or their own uh, code or something like that, uh, make sure that that doesn't, you know, that doesn't end up on the street, right? Those are our, those can be reasons for other to not use the the, the Google's or Microsoft uh, platforms. Um, and the idea is to uh, to sort of have a scalability from pixel to continental, so be able to to look and to understand the things you do on individual pixels, to be able to do that to scale that up uh, to entire you know very large areas on on lower resolution or even on the native resolution, if you have the you know if you have the budget uh, for that and if it's worth the effort. So this is what we uh, uh, what we basically have. So uh, this is the sort of the architecture set up. Uh, and if we then uh, do this, we essentially um, created this OpenEO aggregator that takes uh, requests and that then sends it to different uh, to a different backend depending on uh, which processes are being called, which processes do you need, which of the backends implement these processes. It is not compulsory that all backends implement 100% of the processes, which data sets are being, uh, being requested, are they available? And that's then going to, to, to distribute uh, the aggregator. It's then going to distribute uh, the, the process to this Terrascope platform from Vito, uh, which, which outscales to CreoDS uh, or to the EODC um, um, backend or to the Euro data queue, which is a sort of a joint uh, activity where Synergize and uh, Brockman Consulting and a number of other partners, I think EOX, and so on, a number of partners are involved. Um, then we have EGI, as I said, for the authentication. Um, and by that sort of uh, make it easier to also uh, uh, basically make these, make these uh, services available as, as part of the Europe, European Open Science Cloud. EOSC is a very interesting uh, activity. And we have this network of resources, which is an easy activity, which is basically a uh, um, um, budget for cloud computing, uh, which, is, which, which can be distributed if, 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 the, if the, the purpose is justified that we now, for instance, also use, I think, uh, for our, um, for our um, um, what is it called? Our early adopters scheme. Um, so here is, and I will browse quickly through this because I only have three minutes left. Um, one of the data, one of the um, one of the uh, use cases is uh, creating analysis ready data using the card for L definitions from CIOS. So we applied that and we, we got that into the stack and, and sort of uh, sort of form, were able to formalize the card for L specifications in, in stack requests. These are ways of, of sort of calls that you can do. This looks like a Python script that does this and that basically does some kind of uh, um, normalize, normalizing backscatter. So this is Sentinel-1 data. Uh, here is an example of, an, of a graphical uh, interface where you see the process graph, right? The input, and then 
you click this button and you can see I have this profiles graph now export it as a Python script or export it as an R script. So it is basically an, an code generator, right? So you create your task graphically in this uh, in this editor. You, you can, can go through the collections and then, and then grab Sentinel-2 and throw it in your window and it gets, you know, the input and so on. And then you can sort of move that into code and use that code as a sort of as a starting point, um, as a starting point for more complex code, right? Because of course, if you do this graphically, you're not going to make incredibly complicated things by, 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 by just, you know, doing this, this uh, graphical uh, editing, right? Or maybe some people like to do that, but this is a, a way you can go, sort of go from one to the other. You can also, if you have this client in, uh, in R or in Python, you can also save your, uh, your task as a process graph before it is sent to the API and load that process graph again in the graphical code, in the graphical editor. So there's different ways, there's both ways that you can do. So here are the use cases that we basically have to go through, are going through. Uh, we are now somewhere here, halfway. So there are use cases on ARD, on feature engineering, phenology, time series modeling, uh, event alerting, machine learning, parameterization, sampling, downscaling, regression modeling, uh, high volume SAR. Here is one on crop conditions. Here is one on flood risk. And here is one on air quality. So very, uh, very varied set of uh, use cases that we're going to address in the EO platform uh, project that is going on. So this is basically where you have to go, openio.cloud for the early adopters. Uh, and we look very much forward to, uh, to uh, feedback from users, of course, yeah, and hope to, uh, you know, to, to contact us further. Here's a contact point, and we are also active uh, on Twitter. And I think that was my last, uh, that was my last uh, slide. So I made it one minute before time. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for uh, professor. Um, I, I think you clear very you draw very clear pictures of both Open EO and also Open EO platform. Mm -hmm. which I think will also some uh, raise some questions uh, yeah. from, from the participants. Um, I have in fact a few, but uh, first uh, I want to ask the participants to ask the questions, um, if possible, directly by turning on their videos. Uh, otherwise. Uh, you can also use uh, chat if you want. Or in any case, turning on your audio, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, thanks so much, presentation. I, I don't want to jump in the first one as a person person questions, but I just want to remind people who haven't noticed that the uh, talk is being recorded right now. So uh, in case uh, you do not be recognized by, by your face, you are welcome to turn off your camera. If you do not want to be recognized by your voice, there's also an option of a chat box, um, just for the reminder. Uh, now I open the floor for questions. Good, thanks. May I start? Go ahead. My quiz. Okay. Um, but OpenEO uh, provides um, a unified access for, for the users, and then it uh, boils down to, to the backends uh, for computation and mm -hmm. data access pur purposes, right? So yes. that means we need to have um, uh, some, some code working at the backends. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is how uh, these backends are maintained? Are they maintained by the platform providers, or uh, is, the, is, is there a, a group um, within the consortium uh, who is developing those backends? Yeah, these are backends. They are developed by the uh, by the providers, but they are uh, they are entirely open. They are built on an open source stack. So, uh, right for instance, Vito uh, builds a system in GeoPySpark, and then of course you know has its own management with Kubernetes to to you know to manage their whatever several hundred nodes cluster and so on. So. So they uh, basically they, they already use open source components to to build their backend, and then they write their their interface their their backend interface to to you know to uh, to understand the, to to provide this API and to to be able to answer these API calls, uh, essentially also using op using uh, open source software. So the the, the 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 lower level things are somewhere else. GeoPySpark is an is an independent project and. And I think the UDC uh, backend is, is mostly uh, uh, XRA Dask uh, uh, stack. 
So basically what, what Pangeo does and so, uh, and, and Eurac uses Open Data Cloud, which is another sort of name for similar, for similar structures. Um, and, um, and, and the, the connectors basically are open source projects that are, that, that everyone can use to, so you can set up your own backend and, and basically use that, right? So you can sort of join the whole, uh, you know, the whole intro, the whole uh, ecosystem of, of, of backends if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So you could even, right, you could even run it locally in a Docker image or something like that, build it and run it and, uh, and test it out like that, or you could just use the code directly as in, in some way. I mean, in the end, uh, you know, Jupyter is also, you know, works on web services and so on. So the idea is that you could explore things locally and do sort of little small tests and then and then sort of move them out to uh, to to the to the backend if you want to apply that uh, if you if you're happy with the code and want to apply and see how it works with larger data sets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I noticed some question in the chat box. Uh, so can you want to coordinate? Yeah. So I can uh, I can read the questions. That question: uh, Are the data processed where the, where they are stored by a specific dias? Uh, and how does that then work when Google Earth Engine and Vito catalogs are merged in the process? Yeah, this is a very good question. So what's the impact on speed and volume? So uh, of course, they are, the data are processed where they are. Uh, yeah, so we bring the computations to the data, which is your only option if your data are too large to be moved. Um, and, and that happens indeed in Vito's uh, data center where they outscale to uh, to the Creo Diaz for particular data collections, I think. Um, and um, if you want to do that federated, this is of course a challenge, right? If you want to do something, you know, wanna, you want to add, uh, you want to add Sentinel two to Landsat, right? Have the sum of all the tiles of the whole world. Well, you know, there's no other way than to bring one to the other, right? So you need to bring these two pixel wise together. So that is a hopeless exercise. So it's never going to work. So it, so there's easy to think of. Of, of, of use cases that you that are where the data are in data, different data centers that's never going to happen right that, that nobody will ever or you you know you have to wait in, 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 in infinite into infinity before that is finished uh, so this has an enormous uh, impact on, on speed but typically I think you're not going to do that right so you want to do these things for either for smaller areas or working on uh, lower resolutions. So an interesting uh, uh, sort of challenge to to this this federation problem that I uh, that we have is is like uh, if I have if I send a process graph uh, that that accesses two image collections on different machines and is going to put them together. So where are you going to do which process, right? So how are you going to at, at some stage you need to put things together because it's a graph that that generates a single output. Uh, and, and at some stage, things have to be moved. And then the question is, who's going to decide what has to be moved when? And that is, of course, an optimization problem, right? But again, something that you don't want to sort of worry the user with too much. Yeah? So it's already a new problem in the sense that Google Earth Engine cannot do this, right? Google Earth Engine cannot, you cannot address massive image collections that Earth Engine doesn't have, right? There are, there are image collections it doesn't have because of license restrictions. Yeah, I think, I, I guess the planet data, for instance, it are not, you know, they're not free, they're all kind of restrictive. So you can get access to some of these data if you sign all kinds of things or say you're a student, but an arbitrary or attention user cannot. So if you would, you know, combine Sentinel-2 and, and planet and would do that in Earth Engine, you couldn't, right? And if the planet data happens to be in another cloud, it's a problem. So it's anyway a problem. So it's not like, you know, there's, we don't have a silver bullet for it, but we have sort of infrastructure that can make these things at least easier and under certain con uh, conditions uh, uh, feasible and, and, and sort of uh, take it out of the worry for the, for the users too much, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But, but in, in general, open your, open your platform is not aware of uh, the, the data that is available at each backend and also, in fact, also the resources that are available at each backend. So it's the responsibility of the user to, to choose one and look um, if the data is available. Or right, now it is, right now, the aggregator does that, right? So we say we have this openyo.cloud thing, which is sort of an, an access to, to the backends that are available and, and that chooses for you. Right, so it looks at what are the, which data, in which image collections you're going to work on, which processes are you going to call, and then looks at the backend which matches these. 
right? So it's based on availability of collections and processes uh, by a given backend. It chooses a backend. Okay. But in principle, you can, of course, you know, at one one level lower, you can say, no, I want to connect to that backend with this authentication and do their that, right? And then the you do that, and then the backend will tell you, I can do that and give you a result, or it will give you the answer. No, I don't have that process available, for instance, or I don't have this image collection available. Mm -hmm. um, there is a new question. Uh, how do you see open EO in 10 years away or so? Uh, Hugo Costa is asking this question. Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, and actually, I have been thinking about that uh, somewhat. Um, it is all the, the you know the nice thing is that we started talking and discussing and decided actually doing so. I have been thinking about this already for like ten years. OpenEO, the 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 uh, the project that we uh, submitted for Horizon twenty twenty was not like you know came not from you know like uh, spontaneous. There were like three or four other projects that we submitted in the years before that, which had somewhat you know which, which had relatively much correspondence were just sort of different different ideas different uh different direction took we, we took different directions there and um and and so this so this is um um already going on for a while and we've now been working on it for five years and and now we managed to get basically an early adopters platform right so we got a platform where early adopters can compute yeah so this is already a sort of an enormous um accomplishment i think um but the um the uh, as i mentioned of course it is a difficult field one of the difficulties is that uh it's it's mostly inter or at least my interest my motivation is mostly uh, academic right i'm a scientist i want i'm unhappy with how things are with a vendor lock-in that google earth engine has the 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 uh, you can't see the source code, so you don't know. You don't know what's going. If you don't understand the results, you're you're lost. You cannot go in and see what what sort of what happened. Uh, so I think that is not good, right? But then, um, you know, a large part of Earth observation is also, uh, you know, it's also commercial commercial parties or commercial stakes. So it's a very difficult uh, market in that sense. If you compute it, for instance, to um, to uh, high energy physics, right, the, the CERN or something like that, there are no commercial interests there. Right? They have this large Hadron Collider that they built for whatever, 100 billion or something like that. And they're going to share all the data with everyone involved. And they set up these data centers and so on. And there is not this, this noise that you have with all kinds of commercial parties that do all kinds of things for particular purposes. Right? So, so there is so much more um, you know, commercial value in the value that, that it, it makes it, uh, it the whole undertaking and not strictly. Right? There will also be, there might be commercial users and so on that you would like to serve. Um, the problem with pricing is, of course, that, yeah, we can get free uh, access to Earth Engine and to the planet, uh, Microsoft Planetary, whatever was it. And, um, and um, you know, that is hard to compete with, right? So, um, and for instance, for my university, it is relatively hard to, 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 you know, to make sources go to some kind of, you know, I cannot, I cannot sort of, you know, my university doesn't have a credit card number, so I cannot compute on, on AWS or something like that, right? So there's all kind of, of administrative uh, uh, blockage sort of problems that, that make it difficult for, for, for doing things that, that cost money. On the other hand, you know, we learned how to spend money on hardware, right? And that is now going away slowly. So we need to basically understand how we spend money on software or computing, right? So in any area, there is money, right? So it's not like we don't have money. So if you have a PhD student, you have a budget for doing stuff, right? Now we don't have to buy expensive computers, but we spend the resources on computing, which is much cheaper quite often, right? In the end. So it is not like, you know, it's not like this is about, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of euros or something like that. Or cloud computing is relatively uh, cheap. It is more that the, that the, that the administrative hurdles right now uh, will be uh, will be are, are difficult more difficult than anything else rather than the money I think yeah. uh, so I hope that yeah so I, if this is you know if there are more um, groups that think this is a good idea then you should basically put your money where your mouth is right so you should stop you should stop telling uh, PhD students like go to Earth Engine because this is your only choice to get things done in three years yeah so I stopped doing that actually 
So that is no longer the case. And I tell why this is not a good idea for science. Five years ago, I would tell my PhD student, this is only, your only chance to get the problem that you want to do uh, settled in reasonable time. Uh, it's Google Earth Engine, right? So that uh, there we have to basically, as an academic community, yeah, so uh, sort of uh, follow what we what we think is good for everyone and and and, and do things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, pricing is a problem, yeah, and we don't know what it's going to cost, but it, it doesn't seem to be so uh, so terribly uh, terribly high. It's just an administrative burden. Actually, a cloud infrastructure is abundant nowadays. So uh, and even we have. Um, a lot of resources that are not utilized properly as well. Right. Um, but this can be, maybe we can discuss later on, but I want to, because there's a question uh, from Rolf. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rolf, if possible, I want you uh, to, to ask it also personally, because it's a, a long question. So maybe. Yeah. So, um, right. Yeah. 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 Happy to do, but I thought, let me yeah. carefully phrase it and, yeah. uh, and use the time, you know, usually. You, you may start stuttering. Essentially, uh, thanks a lot, um, Edsar, for your presentation. Very insightful, uh, very useful. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned at some point in the presentation, uh, there is uh, clearly a need for separation of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I would like you to identify what is the concern that you are separating with OpenEO. Uh, it would feel that this seems to be almost only a separation of uh, uh, function names. Uh, I think some of your presentations seem to indicate there's definitely a difference in semantics of operations. Mm -hmm. um, that's, of course, uh, cumbersome and worrying even, I would think. Now, I won't go as far as asking about semantics of operations and proving equivalence because I don't think that would be mm -hmm. fair. That's too hard to do uh, anytime soon. But I would, I would claim that any user of this type of services, going big, wanting big, wanting the best, should care for performance, even though it may be behind the wall, uh, how that gets organized. And, and so my, my claim would be, we, we drastically need a good theory of performance. So, so yeah, so that is a good, that's a nice idea, but let me, let us look at the example of Google Earth Engine. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that that is a problem there? Performance is a problem. And is it a problem that users don't have control over how, how the platform scales or how it is implemented or how many nodes they have? Or do you think that there is a theory needed for users before they can use Google Earth Engine? Of course there is. Oh, but, but there is right now there isn't right we there isn't no no and there you isn't think, you think that that theory should come there before users can use the platform no but i think eventually such a theory should also service there especially because performance means costs yeah but then the, i i think that is then the, the question is whether that is a computer science problem or whether that is an earth observation problem yeah. So whether again separation of like who should we should we learn who should we teach that theory should hydrologists and ecologists and agronomists and so on uh, no, learn that no, theory? This of is not. This is not. This is not. My question is not about who teach uh, who to teach the theory to. It's to develop the theory ah, so okay. that so that we have it as a tool set to yeah. to judge what to do. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that, and that is of course uh, you know a concern of. Um, largely of the of the uh, cloud operators, and I th um, it is I, uh, well. If you talk to the Earth Engine uh, people, Earth Engine was basically set up as a as a research project for yes. them internally. Like, can yes. we do this? Yes, and and how do we scale computation? Right, just to get the knowledge, not the theory, but to get the knowledge and to use yes. that knowledge in other operations. Right, this was sure. just this was just a use case for them. Mm -hmm. The research, yeah. So and then and then they set up the pro. The question is like, you know, who is going to do this theory and what is this person going to do with it? And of course, when you know, when you can do things more performant, then all the better because you save money and your profits will be higher if you offer these things, or, or you can you can offer it at a cheaper price at a more competitive price point. So I agree with that, but I I, I think my point is that this is not, let's say, something that users of Earth observation right now. It is it, it it blocks them. 
Yeah. So right now you have to be a, a, a mix of, of an earth observation expert and, and a cloud cloud computation, performance, uh, containerization, whatever stuff, uh, virtualization expert to, to be able to do these things. And there are very few people who can do that. Now, that's part of actually the reason that hinders uh, use of these technologies, I believe, because eventually if they need to really think, think about how much it, it will cost, then it becomes a, a limiting factor. And partly, for example, uh, in case of Google Earth Engine, why it is not a problem because it's for free. So even if it performs, uh, the thing is, the fair, thing is, you need to understand uh, that things that that look for free are not for free. Yeah, yes, so you're course. paying in some way, and you're paying by first by vendor lock-in, second by allowing Google to to polish their image, to whitewash their image, right? Because that is how they use it, and that is something I, that you need. I, I to don't use. think I ever post my question in the context of Google Earth Engine. No, no, it's just we came back to the question like free and so on. Like, can these yeah. things be for free? And I think in, in, in the, you know, if, if we look, in, as, as Serkan said, a lot of clouds are now, uh, for to a large extent, uh, idle, right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of idle time. So if you could sort of bundle that idle time and, and be able to access that, and that is what Earth Engine also did at the start, right? They also said we have 80% uptime. And if it's busy, then the Google Earth Engine, you just can't do anything, right? So it's only in the idle type. So, so if you could, you know, if you could tap into that, and and hopefully things like Earth, uh, the the uh, European Open Science Cloud can be, uh, you know, uh, places where where these things can be bundled in some way. But then, of course, you have the problem of that the that these that these data sets are relatively static, cannot be moved around. So it is, you know, it's not an easy proposition, uh, I think. But on the other hand, we it is it is also a stage that we are in that might. Uh, that might change in a couple of years, you know, when we sure. when we sort of it's if it's an administrative hurdle, we're beyond it, and it turns out to be cheaper this way, then you know it's done. Sort of just like you know com at com entire universities that do all their computation on Amazon or something like that, they're all administration everything. Yeah, they can do that. Of course, they can do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, sure. Thanks for the question. Uh, are there any other questions? We are a little bit over time, but I think if there are questions, we will be happy to have them. Uh, I have, in fact, many questions, but I maybe we, uh, it's better to ask them at later uh, later time. Um, but uh, Professor Bebetsa, I want to thank you for this very informative and comprehensive um, presentation open, op about OpenEO. Uh, and uh, I, I want to invite, in fact, all the participants to have a look and, and in fact, try it because they can try it. Uh, through uh, the Open EO platform, uh, and this uh, pilot call, my understanding is currently open. So uh, you are also collecting uh, proposals for research projects, right? Uh, to to provide fine, is it? Are we is looking it for early adopters? Really? Early adopters, a little bit further. So people who want to do uh, computation on the platform and are willing to try things out. Okay, so that can be also a good opportunity for uh, for researchers, for PhD students. Uh, Especially to, to... because the plan is now for free and it will not stay for free eternally, probably, right? Because of ease and limited resources and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really a good timing yeah. uh, to, to apply uh, for the resources. Um, with that, uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, we hope to uh, uh, have, have you also physically um, uh, as, as soon as possible. Uh, for OpenEO, but I think uh, we have also an open science community here. I, I believe you are very well informed about that and uh, your work about open science and reproducibility uh, for geospatial data. I think it's also a very interesting topic. So maybe we can also have a, a, we can listen also you uh, about those topics. Good. Um, th thank you very much. It would be cool. Cool. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.